Hi, everybody. Welcome. Okay, Bonnie, we can begin now. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another Kulanu Zoom. We know you come back, so we know you like them. Uh, it's our honor this week to have um, Barbara Vinnick. She's been a, a board member uh, for many years. And um, Barbara Vinnick is secretary of Kulanu. She's a graduate of Bryn Mawr College. Barbara earned a PhD in sociology from Boston University. She worked on 100 Jewish Brides as a research associate as at Hadassah Brandeis Institute at Brandeis University, a center focused on Jews and gender worldwide. I know she's written books on uh, bat mitzvahs around the world and other interesting um, Jewish related uh, articles and books She, for many years. Um, it's really wonderful to have her on, on the board for so many years. Actually, I think at this point, she's our longest standing member of the board, right, Barbara? And uh, what? Probably. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, I'm doing this like 20 years, but Barbara was there before me. So um, we're very honored to have her. I see a lot of people's names. Would you like to briefly Put in the chats where you're from, because usually this is a worldwide effort, these Zooms. Hello, is somebody putting in the chats? Um, I don't see. In your chat on the bottom, Asheville, North Carolina. New Jersey. Boston. Ontario, Washington, D.C. Oh, hi, Aaron and Karen. Raleigh, Pennsylvania. Oh, wow, now it's coming up easy. Ontario, Canada. Um, There's okay. Italy. Italy. Michigan. Okay, New York, New Jersey, everyone, hi. Okay, I want to also give um, up front, start with, we have a few new Zooms coming on and uh, coming about, and I'd like to announce them so that uh, you might be interested. And also, please buy Barbara's book, uh, 100 Jewish Brides. I have friends that are... Um, that are buying these books as uh, engagement presents, wedding presents. Hi, I see someone from Cameroon. Um, okay, hello everyone. So the what I'd like to announce next week on September 26th at 12 noon, we have a Zoom on the Indonesian Jewish community. Um, Rabbi David Kunin, who has been there about 10 times and put together a film that he wants us to view. And there'll be questions and answers about the Jewish communities in Indonesia. We have an event in New York City for those who are around, the story of the Abiyadaya Jewish community in Uganda. It will take place September 23rd at 6.30 at the 14th Street Y um, in New York. And on Monday to commemorate October 7th, um, uh, I have co-edited a book with Marla Brechneider on uh, Jewish uh, uh, reflections on Octo uh, Jewish reflections around the globe on October 7th. It will take place on October 7th. It's a Zoom, and we hope it's. Um, you know, we want it to be a commemoration of the sad event in Jewish history. We hope you join that too. We're also looking for sponsors. Uh, it's $50 to sponsor all these Zooms. And I hope that you consider 
sponsoring. And if you want to sponsor the other two, we'll make some kind of arrangement for $75. How's that if you do the two of them? Okay, so everyone, uh, I hope to start this program. Molly. Oh, 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 wait, let's see who the, oh. Thank you for our sponsors. Let's go. Go ahead, Bonnie. Yes. Go ahead. Yes, here is I the, don't, these are I the don't move it. Molly has control here. These are the sponsors for today's program. Adele Sharness, Tonda Martin, Aaron and Karen Prima, and Rabbi Gerald and Benita Sussman. Thank you for your support. Are we showing a video next? Yes. Come on, let's go. Molly? Dum ba do, 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 dum Yisrael, I'm Yisrael. I'm Yisrael, I'm Yisrael. I'm Yisrael, I'm Yisrael. I'm Yisrael. Okay, that tells you something about we're in 33 countries. Everyone knows our mission here. I'm not sure if there's any new people that have never, um, that don't know about Kulanu, but we support emerging and returning and isolated Jewish communities around the globe. And right now we're in 33 countries, which is a huge, huge responsibility. Um, Barbara, would you like to um, begin your presentation? Well, sure. Um, I think Molly's going to show the first slide. And uh, can everyone see that okay? I have, um, well, let's see. Do you have black okay. lines on your page? On your, uh, I have yeah, some black lines. Yeah, I have lines. some, um, some, uh, Spaces black lines. just have black um, 
boxes. I don't know why. Yeah. Well, maybe they'll go away. <laughs> we'll see. Um, well, let me just start and say that I'm thrilled to be here speaking to my favorite audience, which is people who know and support Kulanu. Uh, Kulanu has enriched my life for, as Bonnie said, probably a couple of decades. And I'm grateful to Kulanu for this book and two others before it, which also uh, focused on Jewish communities around the world. And uh, it uh, put these communities on my radar. And I can talk more about my you know, original um, contact with Kulanu, but uh, right now I'm just going to say that the book was published in February by Indiana University Press and it is dedicated to Kulanu and to Hadassah Brandeis Institute, uh, which is a wonderful organization at Brandeis University where I did the work for this book. And it was founded by my co-editor, Shulamit Reinhardt. So I wanted to make sure that I said that. So I'm going to jump right in and tell you, um, well, I'm gonna tell you about the background of the book, but first I'm going to just tell you about one of the stories that's in the book, which is um, special to me and it's a bit unusual. So uh, the first story, and uh, go to the next one, next slide. The next story was written by the vice president of Kulanu, Rabbi Barbara Aiello. And here she is in her synagogue in the hills of Calabria, in the toe of the Italian boot. And I had the privilege of visiting with her in 2022 and took this picture of her with, hers, with her shofar collection. Uh, Rabbi Barbara founded the um, congregation Ner Tamid del Sud, the Eternal Light of the South, and it's the first active synagogue in Calabria in 500 years. And um, uh, Rabbi Barbara welcomes Anusim, which is Hebrew for coerced, as their ancestors were forced to give up Judaism. And these people are also called crypto Jews, conversos, and Maranos, which is kind of pejorative in certain places, but in certain places it isn't. Um, and these people are discovering and embracing their Jewish roots. And next picture, please. Uh, one of these Anusim is Lupe, and you see her here under the kupa um, with her groom, and this took place in 2010, and it was the first wedding that Rab Rabbi Barbara conducted, and it was amid the ruins of a uh, castle in the town of Nicastro in Calabria. And it's not shown in this picture, but Bar Rabbi Barber wrote something about the um, history of uh, Judaism in this area that I want to read. For Italian Jews, tradition dictates that v vines, olive branches, and ivy, rather than flowers, decorate the chupa canopy and poles. In addition, brides and grooms often tie a small sack of earth to each of the front poles of the chuppah. The earth comes from their respective family homes or from the villages where they or their ancestors were born. The Anusim tradition celebrates the earth which nurtures their Jewish roots that regardless of difficulty, never die. Next picture, please. Next. Um, this <clears throat> picture shows, no, go back, please. No, back. Okay, this picture shows a wedding in Puglia, 
which is the a region next to Calabria. And the bride and groom stand under a hupa of cloth from Kenya, where they both worked as <clears throat> for a, an Italian Jewish um, charity. And uh, uh, Rabbi Barbara wrote about an ancient Kupa tradition of her area, and she quotes Jana, an elderly Calabrian woman. I remember we had a tradition to make a blessing sotto la coperta, under the cloth. You see, one of the women, like my great grandmother, would spend nearly a year crocheting a beautiful bedspread big enough for the bride and groom's double bed. But the first time anyone saw it was on the wedding day. Four men of the family would each take a corner and hold the coperta over the heads of the wedding couple. The two fathers would make a blessing in a secret language. Later on, I learned that the blessing was in Hebrew, the language of the Jews. Okay, next, next, please. Uh, this final picture shows Rabbi Barbara reciting the family unity blessing, another Italian tradition for Rosemary and Lorenzo de Medici, interesting name, and their mothers, the newly married couple's hands bound together with a golden cord. I had never heard of this, but um, in, the, <clears throat> in the pictures that were sent to me, there were a few others of this golden cord binding the hands of the couple and it's a lovely tradition. Um, now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the book. And um, it consists of a hundred stories by and about brides. Um, the stories were written by the brides themselves and others who knew them intimately, their relatives, their friends, clergy like Rabbi Barbara or congregants. And I have to thank my um, granddaughter, Rachel Garrity, for this slide. It shows the some of the um, 83, it shows the 83 different countries on six continents of the world that are represented in this book. They're in blue. And I'm always asked, I'd say the number one question I'm asked is, did you go to these countries? And I have to say that I've met many of the brides on my trips to these countries, but uh, I did not have to go to collect these stories. People sent them to me by email. I edited them, sometimes a lot, sometimes a little, and then sent them back for approval. And um, not only are the stories from 83 different communities, but they're from every time period in the 20th century and a few before that time. Uh, <clears throat> next one. And how did I find them? Uh, to organizations, as I mentioned, who to whom the book is dedicated were very instrumental. And uh, many of the fathers flung communities were on my radar because of my beloved Kulanu. Uh, next one. The other organization is the Hadassah Brandeis Institute at Brandeis University, which is um, dedicated to Jewish women worldwide uh, research and uh, disseminating information. And as I mentioned, that's where I, uh, that's who sponsored the work on this book. Um, and I made use of other means too. I asked friends and relatives, uh, I knew who had married in other countries, and um, I. Um, so it's filled with friends of relatives, relatives of friends, friends of friends. You get the idea. And uh, <clears throat> then uh, there were other times when I just searched the uh, internet for uh, Jewish communities around the world, and if I found the name of like the president of a community. I would send a letter requesting, telling them about the book and requesting their participation. And um, 
I love being in touch with people all over the world. And real, truthfully, one of the main goals of this book and the others I've done is to inform people about Jewish communities around the world, which are little known and, um, and which people should know about. Uh, because people think that they're just in the U.S. and uh, Israel, and this absolutely is not true. Um, I found, I played a game with myself to find an entry from every country in the world, and of course this wasn't possible, but it was a fun way to uh, search for and find as many as possible. Okay, next one. Um, I'm also asked why I chose uh, Jewish brides as a topic for the book, and the answer is simple, that it's a follow-up to uh, Today I Am a Woman, Stories of Bat Mitzvah Around the World. It, this was also published by Indiana University Press about 10 years ago. And um, <clears throat> it um, that topic was uh, chosen because it was a milestone in Jewish women's lives, Bat Mitzvah. And what's the next milestone? Well, marriage, a wedding. Uh, not for everyone, not everyone marries, but and probably fewer these days, but um, uh, most of us have participated in some way or have gone to a Jewish wedding. Um, and I'm very grateful to all the people who took the time to write for, uh, to draft these stories. Um, they dug into memories, they did some genealogical research, I'm sure, because it's amazing how much they remembered. And then they sat down to write and it's not an easy thing to do. This is why I like editing because I don't have to look at a blank screen. And um, okay, next one. Um, and I should stress that this wasn't a research project about the diversity of Jewish wedding rit rituals, although that's certainly a part of it. And uh, many, if not most of the stories amount to um, biographies and autobiographies. People wrote about their family backgrounds, how the couples met, uh, rituals and traditions before the wedding, uh, what the ceremony was like, usually in great detail, customs and traditions after the ceremony. And in many cases, what happens to the what happened to the lives afterwards. Uh, so we organize the book around stages of the journey to the wedding and after. And you can see this is the table of contents beginning with meeting and uh, ending with uh, special chapters on arranged and forced marriages, intermarriages, wartime weddings and marriage in Israel. And uh, although the first people who wrote blurbs about the book wrote about it being delightful and joyful, not all of the stories are happy ones. I just wanted to say that. Okay, now back to some of the stories in the book and the brides. Um, this wedding took place in Panama and you can see Cynthia Cohen Henriquez on a bicycle going into her wedding reception uh, that's being driven by her husband, who was a uh, local rabbi in our community. And uh, this he restored this 1950s bicycle. And I love this picture, which is also on the cover of the book. Um, next one. Next. Uh, she and her husband, David, married at a resort near... Panama City, a former US Army base converted into a rainforest environment. And here you, you see them uh, with the trees in the background. And um, next one, please. Yeah, and here you see them on the shores of the lake that's in this um, rainforest environment, which used to be a US Army base, by the way. And uh, there was one very startling element in the story that she wrote. She kept a diary when she was a young girl. And when she was nine years old, uh, she wrote under things to do, become Jewish. And her, her great grandfather on her father's side was a Jew from Germany 
but everyone in her family was brought up Catholic after her divorce, after his divorce, and uh, Cynthia converted to Judaism before her marriage. And um, she mentions some of the um, traditional elements in a Jewish wedding ceremony, uh, which I'll just briefly mention here. Uh, two cups of wine during the ceremony, which is a holdover from ancient times <clears throat> when marriage was divided into two. Uh, there was the betrothal, eruzin in Hebrew, and then sometimes as much as a year later, the actual wedding, nisuin. And uh, they these became one in the Middle Ages, but they're still two cups of wine, which are holdovers from that time. Um, the ring that's given to the bride was originally a coin of or anything of value. And uh, now uh, a double ring ceremony is the rule. Um, then there's the seven blessings, the Sheva Brachot, uh, which are traditionally sung or um, said by people in the wedding party and um, they bless God, the couple and their union. And another essential element is the ketubah, the marriage contract, which is usually signed before the ceremony, sometimes during the ceremony, but traditionally by two witnesses unrelated to the couple. And now most often by the officiant and the uh, wedding couple themselves. And traditionally, it states a husband's responsibility to the wife, but nowadays it's generally adapted and revised for modern use. Um, next one. Um, a more uh, recent uh, ritual is blessing of the couple under a talit. And this is a very nice uh, picture that... Uh, uh, it's done ma mo many times now um, and makes a lovely photo, as you can see. And finally, there's the best known ritual of a Jewish wedding, which is breaking of the glass at the end by the groom. And this uh, traditionally signifies the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in biblical times. And now uh, it's sometimes... <clears throat> met, um, signifies that relationships are fragile and must be tended carefully. Uh, Cynthia is probably not the only bride who has fainted during the ceremony, and she attributes it to the heat um, of the candles that were lit from one guest to another until the final one reached the chuppah. And this is a lovely element which with unfortunate consequences for her. But next one. Next, here she has recovered and is joyfully cutting the cake. Okay, next one. Uh, the next series of pictures is very special to me because I was the photographer. Well, not this one, Shep Wanon took this one, but the rest of them I took. And um, I, I was there, I actually was witnessed this particular wedding in Madagascar. And uh, 12 couples married together. And uh, this picture shows the women waiting to submerge in the mikvah, which is usually indoors. But in this case, it was in a flowing river uh, outside the city where they rigged up a, uh, a little tent for modesty and people submerged before they converted. 121 people converted and it was a handy thing to have the rabbis there to conduct a ceremony. Also, um, conversion in a, a, a submersion in a uh, mikvah is part of a, the wedding uh, getting ready for a wedding by brides. So it, it served many purposes. Um, this stellar, so I accompanied uh, a bet din of three rabbis 
and a delegation from Kulanu, which was organized by our current president, Bonnie Sussman. At that time, she was the vice president and she did a fantastic job. Um, <clears throat> and uh, these people had been studying Judaism for years and uh, some now were um, thrilled to convert and 12 couples were thrilled to be married Jewishly by rabbis. Um, okay, uh, next one. Uh, so they these 12 couples got married in the hotel where we stayed and they were preceded by, to the chuppah, the brides, by these uh, adorable children singing Hebrew songs. And, um, okay, next one. Here you see a few of the couples who uh, under the chuppah, which was uh, rigged up, um, I think it was a bed sheet and four poles, but it served the purpose and it was wonderful. And, uh, okay, next. Next, okay. And here you see one of the rabbis in the Bet Din who, who had a wonderful voice and is singing the Sheva Brachot that I just mentioned. And you can see that instead, we couldn't have wine in the hotel, so you can see that there's some grape juice which served the purpose at the time. Next one. And here you see Ahava and her husband, Eli, and I interviewed Ahava and uh, she and, and um, her story is, is in the book. Next one. Here you see the happy brides after the ceremony with their gifts of challah covers from the Jewish community of Ghana, which Kulanu gave to them, along with their ketubot, which uh, people from Kulanu, I think the rabbis also prepared for them. And um, you can see they all look very happy. Okay, next one. Uh, this picture shows, um, is also on the, on the cover of the uh, book and it's a it's the wedding portrait of Noreen and Romeo Daniel who married in Mumbai in India and uh, Romeo is the rabbi of the only Indian Jewish congregation in the United States and uh, he called their marriage a joining of two souls and a, ma a match made in heaven. And their wedding took place three years after their mothers, who are first cousins, so their second cousins, arranged it. And um, in her story, Noreen goes into fascinating detail about the um, customs and traditions surrounding marriage in Jewish India. And uh, there was a preparatory ceremony to invoke the blessings of departed, departed family members, as well as the henna ceremony on Saturday before the wedding. And it first involved women in the family slathering her hands, face, and legs with turmeric paste before she rinsed it off in the family mikvah. And she said, they had fun, I did not. Later rituals involved eating jaggery, sugar made from palm sack, sap and a piece of the melita uh, composed of puffed rice and fruit, henna applied to her finger, flowers tied to her head, rice on her shoulders and money waved over her and later given to charity. And uh, the wedding ceremony itself in the Magain David synagogue in Bombay was a grand celebration, but not as distinctive. Uh, next one, please. And here you see um, Romeo and Noreen at their 50th anniversary party. Okay, the next uh, 
The next one, uh, the next story is unusual and I wanted to include it. This is the, um, this is also from India, but this wedding took place in the state of Kerala in the south of India. And this is the famous Paradesi synagogue in Cochin where this wedding took place. Um, <clears throat> and it was unusual even at the time 30 years ago because there weren't many Jews left in Kerala. They had, most of them had emigrated to, to Israel or other places. And uh, the late Elizabeth Joshua wrote, as there were no eligible Jewish women to court in Cochin, Gershon, her husband, came to Bombay to look for a bride. Through common relatives and friends, we met and became a couple in what we call an arranged marriage. We had no religious differences, language and food preferences were challenges, however. Until today, I cannot speak Malayalam, the language of Kerala, and Gershom cannot speak Mar Marathi, the language we spoke in Bombay. Our common language is English. And Elizabeth's uh, wedding ceremony was significant in another way. Next, next picture. Um, it was the only ceremony, at least in this book, that did not involve a chuppah. Instead, Jewish brides like Elizabeth were seated in what she called a bridal chair under a thick tent-like veil, one I couldn't see through. And uh, as you can see, it looks like a large lampshade. Um, after... Um, and the ring, the ring was placed in a golden 200-year-old goblet of wine, which the bride and groom drank from. Uh, next one. And uh, Gershon, the groom, wore a uh, garland of flowers around his neck, which is another of the many customs that and practices that Jews have assumed worldwide from their surrounding cultures. And... Um, Next one. And here they are. Um, they're exchanging rings. And uh, and she said, only after Gershom broke the glass did I come out from behind the veil. Then we exchanged rings and Gershom covered me with his, with his talit, signifying our union. Okay, next one. Okay, okay, this, um, no one would guess, unless they knew, where this wedding took place. Uh, you can assume that it's a uh, an orthodox wedding because you see the bride surrounded by women and dancing with women. And um, <clears throat> so you can assume that it's the a celebration of the orthodox branch of Judaism where men and women don't mingle. And uh, would you be surprised if I tell you that this wedding took place in Bangkok, Thailand? Uh, the bride is Mushka Cantor, who's the oldest daughter of the Australian born um, Chabad rabbi of Bangkok and his wife. And he and his wife came to Bangkok when Mushka was a tiny girl and um, they were sent by the Chabad organization that sends emissaries to all around the world to spark and revitalize Jewish communities. And um, Mushka was very forthcoming about some traditions that I knew nothing about as a progressive Jew. Um, she talked about uh, meeting her husband after flying to Los Angeles to her mother's hometown, people have told had told her that she should meet this, this man. So in that case, it was kind of arranged, but they each had the uh, option of saying they didn't want to go through with it. And this wasn't the first time that this had happened to Mushka, but this time they, they met, they talked on, uh, uh, Skype, they emailed for several months, and then finally they <clears throat> got engaged 
in New York and they um, went to the Ohel, the uh, grave of the Chabad leader, Rabbi Menachem Schneerson to, um, to invoke his blessing for the, and they, that was their official engagement. Uh, next one. And uh, <clears throat> here we see um, the uh, groom um, lowering the bride's veil and um, the uh, groom, Gabi Kaltman, uh, is wearing a keepsake from the Rebbe, as is Mushka, who I think her veil is a piece of uh, fabric that was um, close to the Rebbe, and he's wearing on, under his shirt also something from the Rebbe. Okay, next one. Um, the wedding took place in uh, Bangkok for 500 people. And she told me that her mother was extremely worried because the it was a short time period and there was no place where they could have a wedding for 500 people. So she sent a fax to the Ohel, to the rabbi's grave, asking him to intervene. And the next day she got a message from this hotel in Bangkok that there had been a cancellation and they could have the wedding there. Okay, next one. And here you see Mushka and uh, her four sisters, beautiful sisters. She also has four brothers and uh, they were very happy that she was getting married because she was the oldest and that was traditionally, she traditionally should have married first, which she did. Next one. And here you see the happy uh, groom wearing his traditional uh, clothes and the, the bride. Next one. And here you see Mushka and Gabi with their six little children, the youngest, a few months old, which she sent me. They are now the rabbi and rebbitzin of the modern Orthodox Ark Center in Melbourne, Australia. Okay, next one. Um, okay, the next one, the next wedding I'm highlighting took place in Israel. And uh, the bride is Adina Weiner Avraham. And I interviewed Adina and her husband, David, in their temporary home in Massachusetts. Uh, I should mention that I did interview, if, you know, some people if they lived near me, and I also wrote it up and sent them their, you know, the uh, story, which they approved or, or changed, revised, whatever. So Adina remembers her jarring plane ride to Israel as a child, part of Operation Solomon, which brought a wave of Ethiopian Jews to Israel to from Ethiopia to Israel in 1991. And the first the first group had arrived in Operation Moses in 1984 after harrowing journeys on foot from Ethiopia to Sudan. And this is a picture of Adina's father who was jailed for a time for <clears throat> jailed for a year actually for helping Jews to escape to Sudan. And uh, there are more now more than 125,000 Jews of Ethiopian descent living in Israel with a few thousand more still in Ethiopia waiting and hoping to immigrate. And uh, Kulanu is in contact with people who are trying to help them. Okay, uh, next one. Uh, this shows the wedding which took place in a um, near Tel Aviv. Uh, they had met in a coffee shop that David, who's American born, had um, owned and managed. And uh, the, the officiant is a rare Chabad Ethiopian rabbi. And um, 
here you see David about to step on the glass with Adina and her mother looking on. And um, the wedding preparations for Adina and David's wedding were similar to the ones for Adina's mother who had married at age 14 to a groom she didn't know at the time in Ethiopia, obviously. And, uh, and speaking about her own wedding, she told me, my father went to a farm a month before our wedding. According to custom, a, a rabbi says a blessing over the animals and the people who are there. Then the animals are slaughtered. It is emotional and symbolic. After that, the special work to prepare food begins. Everyone's gets, everyone gets together and helps and makes it a party. You get a whole lamb that needs to be cut up. Foods include, and she mentioned the foods and what they are, injera, dabo, uh, shiro, miser, wat, and, uh, and a, um, everything, um, a lot of it is made with Burberry, uh, roasted and ground spice mixture, and tela, an alcoholic drink made from grain. And the uh, food was put in two large refrigerators. After the ceremony, next one. After the ceremony, the couple stayed under the chuppah and gave each guest a blessing and long shofars were sounded as they walked out to the party afterwards where people danced to Ethiopian music. And um, sir, as Adina explained, certain songs have different dances. And one was Eskista, a special dance for celebrations. As we and our parents danced, guests came up to us, said Mazel Tov, and put money on our foreheads. Um, someone in the family collects it. This is an Ethiopian tradition. And here you see the bride's mother as money is pressed to her forehead. And the next picture, please. And here you see um, the groom's mother, my friend Sarah, uh, as money is pressed to her forehead. And uh, this marriage was certainly a melding of two cultures. Okay, next, next one. Um, most of the stories in the book are of everyday people from all walks of life and um, not from celebrities, household names, or professional writers. And one exception is the late Hetty Freed, a psychologist and author born in Romania and uh, honored by Sweden, Romania, and Germany, and named European of the Year in 1997. And uh, to our chapter on wartime stories, she generously contributed a moving and dramatic memoir that begins in the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. And I'm gonna read a little of what she said. Where my sister and I had been taken and where we waited for death. The day after the liberation, I started to roam the camp in search of my father. Crossing formerly isolated areas through torn bar barbed wire, I saw men and women outside their barracks lying in the mud. And she tells more, but I won't even go into it. Walking on, I came across some men sitting around a fire baking potatoes. One of those was Premzi, whose real name was Michael Fried, an older man who had played bridge with her parents in Romania, which she told me about. We recognized one another and to my question, he could only shake his head saying that my father had never had a chance to enter Auschwitz. Then he told me that his younger brother had died just a few days before the liberation. We sat there mourning speechless, gazing into the fire. Before I left, he generously gave me some raw potatoes. Hetty goes on to tell of a chance meeting on the street in Malmo, Sweden, where both had been taken to recover. Um, a Swedish friend who was with her urged to invite this acquaintance to tea, which she did. Marianne was very impressed by this dashing young man. It was the first time that looking at him through her eyes, I stopped thinking of him as an old man of my parents' generation. This meeting was followed by several more. Suddenly, I found myself in love with this man, 18 years my senior. And um, this is a picture of her sister's wedding party and Hetty is on the left, her sister is in the middle, 
And um, this took place around the same time as Hetty's, which was much more modest, but her sister married at the uh, Great Synagogue of Stockholm. And uh, she writes, uh, in a true romantic fashion, after a series of setbacks and, mar and partings, Michael and Hetty uh, got married <clears throat> uh, in the town hall and then in a modest Jewish ceremony with a small reception at the home of his landlady. And the next one. Next one. Uh, this is Hetty in 1948, who was thrilled to have her own flat finally. And there's another picture of her husband uh, at the, in the same time period. Um, she ends in she ends with, in 1962, after 14 years of happy marriage, Michael died, leaving me with three small children, Gabriel, age 11, and Thomas and Kai, age nine. Still, Michael is present even today. I see him in our seven grandchildren and three great-grandchildren. Hitler wanted to exterminate my extended family of 58 people. Today, counting my family and my sister's family, we have almost reached that figure. Next one. And this is a picture of Hetty in her later years. She passed away, I believe, in 2022. Okay. And, uh, okay, this uh, next one is probably the most elaborate celebrations in the world that took place in Morocco. And this is Rachel Jacobson, whose grand nephew uh, married. And that's the uh, that's her sister who was the groom's mother. And you can see them in these very elaborate caftans, which they changed many times during the henna ceremonies, which are, the ceremony is actually more um, lavish than the actual wedding. Okay, uh, next one. Here you see the bride, Esther, and the groom, Steve, being carried into the henna party in palanquins, uh, sort of um, uh, thrones carried on the shoulders of men in, in costume. <laughs> Next one. And uh, this is Esther herself. And um, Rachel tells us that the couple was showered with lavish gifts and the and that the bride to be was covered in jewels and uh the 500 or so guests had henna uh rubbed into their palms as a testament that the couple is willing to marry and as henna stains the hand for as long as six months that they will not be forgotten and are blessed and here they are dressed comparatively plainly for their wedding so uh you can see that 100 Jewish Brides is a melange of weddings in time and place. And uh, it was a joy to collect these stories. And I'll just end with a summary of the book from Blue Greenberg, who's a beloved pioneer of Jewish feminism. And then if there's time, um, I'll take some questions. There might be like five minutes. Um, she says, 100 Jewish Brides is a chronicle of contemporary Jewish life, recent historical events, customs ancient and new, ethnic influences, binding traditions, social mores, family relationships, ritual creativity, diaspora diversity, all this and much more tracked through the preparation, celebration of courtship and marriage. I could never have summarized it like that. Oh, and one more thing, read this book for pure enjoyment. You will tear up with emotion on this page and laugh out loud on that one. So that's it. And if anybody has any questions, I think that uh, Molly. Yeah, thank you, Barbara. I appreciate that. That was really great to see so many fascinating brides and hear more about their stories and see the photos. So thank you so much for sharing and putting that together. We have one question so far in the chat that was asking where the last wedding took place. Uh, which, oh, the wedding the in Hannah. Morocco? Yes. The wedding in Morocco? Uh, it took place in, the wedding itself took place in Casablanca, and the the henna 
ceremony for 500 people took place in Marrakesh. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Um, I'm curious for the people who are uh, watching, do they have any interesting, unique wedding uh, um, uh, rituals that you may not have mentioned? Oh, I'm sure they do. <laughs> if anybody- well, if does anybody want to share some? If anybody yes. wants to share uh, their own. In fact, when I've given this in, uh, in person at uh, Hadassah meetings or, um, or JCCs or synagogues, uh, sometimes people are asked to bring some uh, wedding, uh, you know, wedding uh, objects from their own wedding or their parents or pictures. And it's always nice to, to hear about other yeah. people's weddings. So if anybody has a uh, a story, that would be great. Well, I, this was not from my wedding, but I've been to weddings that uh, people who were associated with Chabad, they used to get the Rebbe's old shirts to put under their uh, whatever they were wearing. I right, know that's that what I mentioned when I showed the picture of uh, Gabi and Mushka uh, Kaltman. Uh, he was wearing, uh, yes, a fabric under his his shirt, and the bride was uh, had her um, veil uh, a, was a piece of of fabric from from the Rebbe. And uh, I've seen, not that she mentioned it, but I've also seen pictures of brides having to be led by other people to the chuppah because they can't see through that right. veil. The veil, the veil uh, right, how thick the veil yes. is, is another custom that got, I, I actually thought this is so fascinating. I mean, it's culturally interesting. It preser preserves Jewish practice. And I bet this could be done for Pesach, Sidorim, and, and all kinds of Jewish rituals, what they do, Rosh Hashanah meals around the world. Um, you know, like this whole mm -hmm. fascination around global practice through the ages is really, you really contributed such a beautiful piece of scholarship, you know, to this, to the history of the Jewish people, actually. And uh, yeah, I want to say thank you. Everybody should go buy Barbara's book. You can buy it online. I mean, I think it's fabulous. I bought a copy. So on, uh, it's on Amazon. It has been for a while since February. So, uh, yeah. So this has been a pleasure. Thank you. I want to thank everybody. I want to thank everybody for coming. I see there are new names. I I don't necessarily rec uh, recognize everybody's name, but I do recognize some names. And I want to thank you all for coming. I also want to remind you that Rosh Hashanah is coming up and we give food grants to, I forget how many, 30 communities or so across the world, Latin America, um, Latin America, uh, all over Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and it would be lovely if you would like to contribute some money to help us feed meals to these um, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. Kulanu gives community grants to lots of communities around the globe. Um, I also want to remind you that we have two new Zooms coming up, one on Indonesia and one on October 7th. Um, and spread the word, spread the word about Kulanu, go to our website, share information, share information about Barbara's book. I want to thank Molly, who everything happens in Kulanu because of Molly. I want to thank Joanne for her help um, around all this distribution of funding that we collect to give to communities around the globe. Um, does anybody have any other comments? I see that um, the Primax are here, or they were here. Uh, they're some of the founders of Kulanu. 
And maybe they'd be interested in saying a word or two about this. Well, I'd like to just mention that uh, I, my entree to Kulanu was through Karen Primack, who I met in Washington, DC. I was researching a uh, book on Purim around the world. And she told me, oh, I can, uh, I can put you in touch with people in Jewish communities all over the world. I said, really? How is that? And she told me about Kulanu. So that was- Yes, that we've, was had, we've had a wonderful time with Kulanu for, uh, since uh, 1995, I guess, when we started. Yeah. So Kulanu is a volunteer organization, and it's only because volunteers, who some of them are part of this chat, uh, so part of this uh, uh, Zoom, and others around the world, that Kulanu really now is one of the key players. We are, um, in a way, the last uh, the last group standing that does this kind of. Uh, Jewish development around the world, and anyone who has ideas or uh, want to volunteer in some capacity, please email molly at molly at kulanu.org uh, or benita at kulanu.org, and I bet you Barbara has a kulanu.org email as well, and um, we'll help try to get you involved in some way. Um, and we hope you consider giving us some contributions around Rosh Hashanah and attend the next two Zooms. And if you're in New York, to attend the um, the program on Uganda in uh, the 14th Street YMCA. Anyone, finally, any other comments? I, I see some dear friends who are here, uh, Margie and Dick, Roz, Marion. Thank you for coming. I see Naomi and Judah. I assume you're my Staten Island buddies that are here. Um, okay, everybody, thank you. Kativa uh, v'chatima tova. May you all be inscribed in the Book of Life. Um, may we get through these tough years and tough times for the world and the Jewish people. And uh, may we see better news this year. And Shana Tova to everyone.